begins with you, the founders, getting out of the building and talking to customers. You don't show them your business model canvas. You don't even go through all nine boxes with them. You want to have a peer-to-peer -peer conversation with somebody to get a sense of what they think first about the problem you're solving and then about whether your idea actually helps to solve that problem. Now, if you have a really wealthy uncle or a crazy investor, you could pay McKinsey to do this. Probably, they'll probably only charge you $150,000 a month, minimum six months. Um, and you'll have the most beautiful PowerPoints, and you'll have all these great arrows and diagrams and rationales and all this sort of stuff. But you know two things about when you send McKinsey out there to do it. Number one, the last three slides talk about the next four things they're going to do for you and how much those are going to cost. Cost. Number two, and that's a requirement in the consultants' union, the last four slides must talk about the next steps. Number two, they're going to sort of buff the rough edges of this because they don't want you to think your baby's ugly. They don't want you to think this idea is a dog and that customers hate it. So they're going to find enough little nuggets of gold to somehow put a good spin on it to, to have the payoff in those last four slides. You could also send 25-year-olds or interns from your office out to do it. Go show our product to 25 people and come back in tonight and tell me what you learned. Well, boss, I showed it to 25 people. 20 of them thought it sucked. Four of them thought it really sucked. And one of them said, eh, I might be interested. How many 25-year-olds, how many interns are going to come in and say that? They're going to come back and say, well, people really like the colors of the UI, or they thought that button was really cool, or the little animation demo. That was great. Okay, but were they going to buy it? Well, we didn't really, didn't really want to go there. You need to hear this stuff yourself. Right? You need to hear directly from the customer. Ah, I don't know. SAP does a pretty good job of that for me now, and I already own it and we're all trained on it. Or, I, I don't know, I've seen 11 of these. This one seems sort of like the other, you know, other 11. You know, thank you for stopping by. Or uh, one of my favorite uh, examples of founder going out and doing um, uh, customer discovery himself. Uh, I guess it's a favorite because... Uh, at the next round of financing, based on what this founder found, Goldman Sachs came in at 15 times our original investment. That usually is a validator of some sort. This was a small company, five guys in um, Trumbull, Connecticut, started a company called Cybergnostic. Okay? Basically, they were a very small systems integrator focused around computer security back in uh, about year 2002. And they had a really great sales lady, and she went out and she got the, the founder an appointment with the VP of operations of the New Haven Bank for Savings. Three branches, tiny little bank. The VP of operations handles everything from counting the money, hiring the security guards, getting the parking lots swept, and managing the director of IT, whose job it was to basically put more rolls of paper in the ATM. You know, this was no sophistication in technology at all. Uh, small bank, they only have so many resources. So the VP says to Andy, the founder, the reason I called you here today is I need to bundle up all the internet security and network security that I need for my network uh, because I'm getting real heat from the FDIC about my computer security. And the way I understand this is supposed to work is most of these things I can buy by the month, so I want you to buy them for me, and I'll pay you a commission or a fee or whatever for doing that, and I want them all to come together through my T1, providing me complete security. Andy said, well, yeah, we can do that. It's probably, you know, 150, 200 hours of upfront work at $150 an hour. That would be about $30,000. The guy said, no, no, you didn't hear me. I want to pay by the month. I don't have the $30,000. And Andy's hemming and hawing and getting ready to pack up his bag and get out of there. 
And the guy said something that you would never find in a survey. McKinsey wouldn't find it for you. Your interns wouldn't find it for you. The guy said, Andy, do you realize there are 9,000 little banks just like us in the United States, and almost every one of us just got this nasty letter from the FDIC saying, if you don't fix your network security by the end of the year, you know that little FDI sticker in the window of your bank? Get a razor blade and take it off. Andy said, you mean there's five, 6,000 customers with the identical problem? I said, yes, Andy, big beefy guy, makes me look petite, got up, said, we're in. No up front. Today, he has 2,000 banks, 800 credit unions, 600 car dealers, revenue of $75 million, profit over $10 million a year. And it's just they're just sort of trying to pick off a couple more similar industries before they, you know, crank, crank out the IPO. That founder hadn't heard that random sort of outlier comment, right? The sales VP would have come back and said, ah, that guy wants too much free work. It's not worth it. We're moving on to the next customer. You've got to hear that yourself. When you're showing somebody a demo of your web app or site and they get lost, don't correct them. Just make notes. And then when they're done, even if they're totally lost in the woods. How come you clicked on the blue button? Our plan was that everybody click on the green button. You didn't do that. Oh, I didn't see it. Or it, it said, help, not next step. Or another. Let the customers tell you what they like and don't like about every aspect of um, the product or service. And don't delegate this. It's a pain in the ass. It's a lot of work. It's much easier to sit at your desk and give commands to people and code and write great copy. But this is where the action is, right? If there are 350,000 startups, how many of you really have a unique idea sitting here today? I mean, that's a whole lot of clutter and very difficult to stand out in 350,000 of just about anything. Don't you want to poke at this and get as much feedback as you possibly can? Uh, oh, OK. Um, so getting out of the building is the core of customer development. It's a four-step process. Truth be told, we've stopped talking about steps three and four, because what we found in the fast couple of years is that startups get so much traction out of these first two steps that you can't bury them in more information, number one. And number two, at the end of customer validation, you should have a company that's starting to go like this, that's starting to either have positive cash flow or be on a path to that positive cash flow. Almost any reasonably respectable management team can take a company that's going like this and keep it going like that. And so we decided to focus all of our energy, and if it's marketing fraud, so be it. The you know four steps of the epiphany is now two steps, so to speak, to the epiphany. Um, and there's one other reason, and that is, I mean, if you sum up these first two steps, Step one is get this feedback, try to get some rough idea that you're really onto something. Step two, customer validation, is okay, let's see if we can scale this a little bit. We were getting three orders out of 10 sales calls over here. If we now have three salespeople and we make 200 sales calls, do we get 60 orders or do we get 20 and all our economics fall apart? Right? Um, you know, we're able to acquire customers over here for $2 a click. Oops, over here, they're $4 a click because we bought all the $2 clicks. So validation says, if we sort of start opening the faucets a little bit, do all our assumptions still hold up? And as entrepreneurs, the payoff for you is the longer you can delay your fundraising, Ideally, till you get here, the more equity you preserve for yourselves and your founding team. 
Because I don't care how good you are or how bright you are or how wonderful your idea is. Over here, your investor pitch says, hi, we're a bunch of brilliant NYU Stern MBAs. We have a great idea. We've got a great team. And we are sure this is a great business, right? And that's essentially your pitch. Over here, your pitch is, hi, we're the same bright bunch of NYU MBAs with a great idea. But we have now tested this idea. And we have now validated that it is a machine. You put a dollar in the coin slot at the top of the machine, and it sort of chunks around, travels around for a while, makes some noise, some smoke. And every time you put a dollar in the top, 14 cents comes out of the bottom. And so we would like you, Madam Investor, to give us a bigger pile of dollars to make more 14% pre-tax dollars and we think we can grow it from there, doing all the things we've learned along the way. So think of how much you have de-risked your startup for investors in this conversation versus the one over there. And believe me, I've raised money in both environments. I've got the set of mirrors and a little smoke machine and all that sort of stuff. In today's economy, it is so much harder to do, everybody expects you to, you know, have some kind of proof and not a whole lot of guesses. And that is far more the truth on this coast than in the valley where they still believe in fairy tales and Santa Claus and things like that because Santa Claus has come down that chimney so damn many times out there versus here. And so you are today all the way over here the farther you can drive your startup, the better you preserve your equity. And this is a very inexpensive step. You're talking about maybe the combined MasterCard limits of the founding team, or $10,000 on Kickstarter, or no money at all, because one of your team members is the hacker, and he, can, he or she can build a nice working prototype of this, you know, in a couple of weeks or a month or whatever with, you know, Amazon web services that you buy by the slice on your credit card and with uh, almost no, you know, no serious money expended other than subway tokens, pizza, and, you know, stuff like that. Right? In the mid-90s, when startups sort of first landed on the East Coast, Step one was raise a couple of million dollars. Step two was hire six or eight developers. Step three was buy three, four, five hundred thousand dollars worth of hardware and two, three hundred thousand dollars worth of site licenses from Oracle or SAP or whomever. You can rent all that stuff literally by the month. You can be a Microsoft Biz Spark partner and they will give it to you for free for a couple of years because they don't want you going open source. They want to sort of put the needle in your arm and get you hooked on Microsoft software. Right? Very, very little spending. Okay? We do this, this kind of course um, in a five-day version called the Lean Launchpad. We had a team in the last... Lean launch, and with the Lean Launchpad is the same program used by 240 teams a year of the scientists funded by the National Science Foundation. I'm teaching it right now in Moscow and in Bogota, and we're getting ready to go to Greece. It's at Stanford, it's at Berkeley, it's at Columbia, and hopefully it'll, you know, Frank and Cynthia will be teaching it here at NYU pretty soon as well. In the five-day course, in the month of August, the team got up on the first morning and presented what I thought was the stupidest idea I had ever heard. It was a company called Jersey, Jersey Central. And the idea was sports, celebrity sports jerseys are two, three hundred dollars And then the guy gets arrested on drugs or for, you know, pedophilia or he gets busts his leg. Now you're $250 Tarkington. I just Fran Tarkington still play football, whatever, it doesn't fit my brain. Anyway, uh, you know, uh, that jersey is suddenly worthless and you're using it to wash your car. So they said, we're going to do a business where you can rent the jersey. So if you go into the game 
And you want to wear the Rimalowski jersey that's extra wide for the shoulders to, to get all those letters on it. Um, you want to wear that jersey to that game? You send them twenty nine ninety five. It arrives, you know, the next day. You send it back within a week, or you can buy it and so forth. Now, that's a stupid idea. I guess we're gonna. At least there's room for improvement. Monday night. So we said to these guys on Monday, "Well, what are you gonna do for your customer discovery?" And they said, "Oh, we're gonna go to Yankee Stadium." <laughs> oh yeah, ha ha ha! Good for you. What clever guys you are to make your evening study going to the Yankee games. No, no, we have no tickets. We swear, nope, we're not going to the game. And they had pictures of them interviewing over a hundred customers. Hey, would you like to rent one of these? I see you're not wearing one, you're wearing one, whatever. They learn, number one, real enthusiasm for the idea, right? Because I don't really need to wear that Giants jersey all year. I want to wear it to the one game or to the Super Bowl party or to whatever. They also discovered a totally unexpected surprise market segment that almost doubled their market, and that was the girlfriends wanted them too, so that if their boyfriend or husband said, come on, we're going to the Yankee game or the Giants game or the Jets game, they could surprise them by wearing the jersey of that boyfriend or significant other's favorite player, and they could do it for $25 or $30, not $200 or $300. So that, that was their report on Tuesday morning from their first night out of the building, and they swear they never entered the stadium, right? And I'm, you know, I'm gullible, I'm, you know, whatever. Uh, I, I, I think actually to do 69 interviews and, and then go back and write it all up, maybe they really didn't go to the game. Thursday night of the same week, right? So this was Tuesday morning. They reported on their Yankee findings. Thursday night, I'm sitting doing my email about 10 p.m., and I get an email, Jersey Central, announcing our grand opening. Save $10 on any jersey you want. Click here. I'm going, wow, it's only Thursday. That's pretty cool. And I click on it, and the damn link doesn't work. And I say, well, okay, good try. Not bad. And a couple of minutes later, I go back to the same email. I click on it again. Boom, there it is, fully dimensionalized site, pictures of jerseys, pick your team, pick your player, pick your size, give me your address. Friday morning, they stood up in front of their class of 25, 25 teams of startups. We got our first three orders from people we don't know overnight. They got out of the building, in this case, first physically, and then on the web, said, let's see if this idea has any legs. And that's what customer development is all about. The old way to build that business would have been, well, let's see, we need 12 Tarkinen jerseys, and we need 24 of this and 15 of that, and we need these and that and whatever, and we need a warehouse, and we need a dry cleaner, and we need a big website, and in three or four months, we'll see if we have a business. These guys did it in three or four days. Obviously, it was not the complete, ultimate business, and they had lots of problems to work out, but what they determined was that they, A, they had customer demand, B, they could affordably move people through the sales funnel. In other words, they were buying 10 and 20 cent Google AdWords and they were getting the initial sense that the conversion rate was good enough. They found that Facebook and email helped them even more. So they were learning all about the behavior and performance of their customers in two or three days with maybe $75 or $100 spent, right? The website was built on Yahoo Store, which I think is still $5.95 a month. Intuit has, you know, instant store for $4.95 a month. A um, couple of AdWords. I mean, you're talking about beer money, startup testing. Isn't that a hell of a lot better than six months and 50 or 100 or 250 thousand dollars to find out whether your idea is good bad or ugly and that's the kind of thinking you need to deploy to be as successful as you can be in finding customers that are really sort of uh excited about uh what you're doing so i think um so getting out of the building period sort of end of story. But there's much more to sort of this first step, right? The hardest part for entrepreneurs, which I mentioned 
earlier, and I just want to reiterate it, is when you are out doing customer discovery, you are not selling. You're listening. You're having a conversation. And when the customer tells you, gee, I don't really think that's a problem at all, your response is not, well, do you realize this? And do you realize the erosion of your margin? And do you realize this and this reason and this reason? Your playback is, well, why don't you think it's a problem? Or how do you solve that problem now? Or who solves it better for you? You're trying to evoke as much substantive feedback as you can. And right, there's a, some engineering, why did this blow up? Uh, theory of the five whys. Well, why isn't it a problem? Okay, why would you, so, you know, why would you go about the, just keep drilling down and down and down to learn as much as you can and hopefully every once in a while a little neat kernel of an idea is going to pop out that will help you think about ways to, to reshape your business. Entrepreneurs genetically like to sell, right? Oh, what do you mean the user interface isn't very good? Did you see that button? Did you see the color? Do you know how many focus groups we did and how everybody else told us it was great? That's selling. That's not kind of uh, conversing. And, you know, use that sort of gentle, evocative approach to get as much sort of information as you can. Um, I don't know. If this, oh, there it is. Okay, I've sort of said this a couple times, <coughs> but I. So, so really, only eleven fifteen. Wow. Okay, we're we're doing pretty well. Um, oh no, it says eleven thirty Q and A. I got. All right. Anyway, we. I think I think we're right. Um, you always want to separate your trips out of the building into two distinctly separate trips, and we're going to talk more about this sort of later in the day, but the first one is totally devoted to, am I solving a problem you care about? How do you solve it now? Where do you turn to get advice or suggestions on how to solve it? Where have you gone in the past? Who would you look to? Who would you call? If you had that stack of invoices on your desk, would you call other controllers? Would you go to the accountant's trade show, which I'm sure is quite an exciting uh, place to be? Um, you know, how would you find us if we launched a product to solve this problem? Right? And then the second part of it that's equally important is how big a need or problem is this really? Is this a problem for one person in 100, one in 10, one in 20? Is there a market? And the way I like to think of this is it's the, the Viagra question, right? How big is it going to get? And will it last longer than four hours? <laughs> okay? Am I serving a real market that's sustainable, that can feed my family and my investors' families for many, many years to come? Generally speaking, businesses buy things because you solve problems for them. Consumers tend to buy things sometimes to solve problems, but very often to fill a need. And the need could be anything from, you know, less tooth decay to love or romance or sex or an Hermes scarf, which may have something to do with some of the prior items in the list. Um, it's a need, right? It could be a need to have friends and to share experiences. Look at, look at Facebook. Is there anybody whose life would really end if Facebook shut down tonight, uh, other than maybe Mark Zuckerberg and Sheryl Sandberg? Um, probably not. But an awful lot of people spend an awful lot of time there. It fills their need to sort of share their world with their friends and to learn, you know, keep up with their friends and family and so forth. So finding that really important need it's a critical part of, of this first part of discovery. And if you think about Facebook, right? Facebook, I don't know, I assume, is there anybody here who has not seen the social network? Okay, home, that's your homework. Go see it. 
a great lesson in startup mojo, right? So, and insanity, and it's fun. Um, right? What was the need? Originally, you know, the foundational need of Facebook, right? It wasn't showing pictures of your cousins and whatever. You got it. Is that a guess or are you stretching? Right. Finding women for geeks, right? Getting dates for geeks who were sort of glued to their computers. And, uh, and so on and so forth. Not, and, and that's pretty dramatically different premise than the, pre, you know, the sort of value proposition of, of Facebook today, but it filled a real need. It melted down the servers at Harvard very quickly because of the traffic and so forth. And then, after you are sure that you've really got something that people care about, come back to the office, and we'll talk more about this next step after lunch, compare it to the available industry data, third-party data, you know, compare this feedback to facts you can gather, and once you're really starting to convince yourself that, man, this is really a problem or a need, then go back and say, hey, you told us this was a real problem for you. Let me show you this gizmo here. Does this solve that problem? Oh, you need to tell the time? Well, if you hold it this way, it does it very well. In other words, first, right, if you go back to one of my very first slides, right, you've got customer segment over here on your right, right? Who is the person I'm solving this problem or filling this need for? And product over here, what is the, you know, product or solution? So market uh, and, you know, product, product market fit. If you, you want to do those separately, because otherwise everything becomes fuzzy, blurry anecdotes. You can't separate the feedback on the opportunity from the feedback from the product. You lose sort of control of the conversation because it can go so many different places. This process begins with what we call the minimum viable product. Right? The sooner one, right, once you've established that you're solving a real problem or filling a real need, now you need to get customer reaction to your solution. And so if you go in there with a 14 PowerPoint slides, oh, the market is like this, the problem is this, the solution is this, it's very hard to get a real honest reaction. If you go in and you show them this thing made out of styrofoam and duct tape with a fork stuck in here and a light bulb screwed in there, you say, this is the anti-gravity machine. You turn the light bulb on, gravity disappears, and you float off into space. Would you really like to have one of those? You're giving them some idea of what it is. Now, if you're building you know, jet engines, it's very hard to do a minimum viable product. Right? The minimum viable product is the earliest possible, roughest, quick and dirty manifestation of your product. If you have some elaborate website, it's three or four or five non-working screenshots that give me a feeling for the user interface, for what problem you're solving, for what you're doing, what the navigation is going to be like. Right? I would bet that everyone in this room, if we sent you off and told you to build those five screens by dinner, you'd come back with some pretty interesting stuff and everybody could get their work done. How do you bring the product to life in some way or another as quickly as you can? Say, here, customer, take a look at this. This is just give you a feel for what we are going to do. Or try this one-of-a-kind fragile prototype and tell me if you think it's interesting to you solving the problem that you just told me a few weeks ago you have in spades. Now, the problem with a jet engine is, uh, you know, excuse me, Mr. Customer, would you like to, you know, this is a rough preliminary prototype of our new jet plane that's faster and uses less fuel and, and so forth. How'd you like to take a test flight with me? Um, probably not going to happen. But what you could do in that case show some design mock-ups, explain the performance characteristics, and, you know, and that, that sort of a thing. 
But very early on, you need to understand who is the customer segment I'm going after and what can I do to show them some tangible manifestation of the product so that I can get some, you know, sort of visceral, honest feedback to the product itself. So let me give you a couple of examples of uh, minimum viable products, right? Probably the best one of all time uh, was Google, right? When uh, Sergey and, Sergey and Larry went into one of the most enlightened venture capitalists on the planet, Sequoia Capital, uh, who was only invested in a few winners like HP, Apple, Yahoo, um, and every winner since. They have a, the most intimidating uh, large screen LCD TV in their, uh, over their reception desk, just flashing IPO after IPO after IPO after IPO, all of which they backed. So somehow, Sergey and Larry got introduced and went in there for a meeting, and they presented their search algorithm and their early working clunky imperfect search engine called Google. At that time there were 14 search engines on the internet, right? Things like Look Smart, Yahoo, you name it, 14 competitors. And they said, well here's the difference between us and all the other 14. It's in the way the algorithm tells us to present the results based on what consumers click on the most as opposed to what advertisers want them to click on the most. And it constantly evolves and iterates and changes the stack based on who's clicking on what and so on and so forth. And here's what our user dynamics look like. You know, we started with six users day one, 24 day two, 90 day three, and we are just going like this. And so we need some money to keep going like this, but we have no idea how we're going to make any money. Because right now, all we're doing is this free search engine. It's really fun. We've spent a lot of money. We're exhausted. And the Sequoia guys said, close the door. We have three things to say to you. Number one, you're not leaving our office without a check. Number two, uh, if you'd like to each take some money out, we're glad to buy some of your personal stock from you because we think you've got a long way to go before you're going to be rich, and we want to be your partners for a long time. If you want to buy a house or a Jaguar or whatever, that's fine. Uh, they didn't know that Sergey was an airplane junkie. I think he has seven of them, including like his own 747. Uh, must be nice. But anyway, the third one was the most important one, and really the wisdom of Sequoia. The only condition to us giving you all the money you want we want you to shake our hands and agree that we're not going to think about how Google's going to make money for two years. We just want you to be the most dominant search engine on the planet. Put all of your talent and energy into that. Get every customer on Earth. And we are dead certain, as we've seen at Yahoo and Apple and here and there and everywhere, if we have 50, 60, 80 percent share of search traffic the, the office dog can figure out how to make a ton of money on that opportunity. So let's agree totally fine. And they walked out with a check, and the rest is certainly one of the great uh, examples um, of, you know, internet success in, in, you know, in our century, in our current century. The other one that I love, and the, these two stories are almost identical, Zappos and diapers, okay? The, they both sold to Amazon for plus or minus a billion dollars in the last year. They both started with nothing, no money, no financing, right? Diapers was started by two young guys who had just cashed out of a small startup, took home maybe a million dollars each, were bored looking for something to do, and they were kind of getting tired of changing their baby's diapers and, you know, running to Costco and this and that. They said, there's got to be a better buying experience for diapers than we and our wives are going through. Let's try to change the shopping paradigm for diapers. So if you're going to go into retail diaper business, right, what are the first things you need, right? You need a warehouse, you need inventory, you need a website, 
need, you know, packing and shipping equipment, probably need a couple forklifts, loading dock, right? They say, hey, we don't do any of that. That's too much work. Let's first see if we have a business model that works. So what they do? They put up a little website that said, welcome to diapers.com, a revolutionary way to buy diapers. The diapers were still exactly the same ones you could buy at Walgreens or Walmart or Costco or any place. 48 pack of six month scented, 72 pack of 12 month boys, you know, whatever. Their value proposition, right? Was same, the product didn't change. The other elements of the value proposition changed. Absolute guaranteed lowest price. Absolute guaranteed delivery tomorrow. 24 hour a day, seven day a week, elegant customer service, any size, flavor, configuration, type of diaper you want on your front porch tomorrow at guarantee the lowest price available anywhere. Okay? Sounds like shit, gee, you need a whole lot of stuff to make that business happen. They did it with like a $20 website, right? Here, list all the diapers, list all the prices, pictures, you know, pictures of diapers are sort of pretty ordinary, right? Until uh, you get to the full ones, that, that's a more interesting. Right? Um, they put the website out, they started emailing all their friends, they started doing some cheap ad words, Facebook posts and stuff like that. And every day about 4.30, it's the only crap, we got 82 orders today, okay, you. Take the station wagon, go to Costco. You, take the van, go to Walgreens. You, take the truck, go to Babies R Us. They used the retail distribution to prove their business model. They lost money on every single sale because they had to be the absolute lowest price. They got screamed at by the local Walmart manager, you're buying all the diapers. Well, isn't that why you put things on a shelf in a store? Um, you know, but you don't have leaving any for anybody else. Well, gee, I'm sorry, I'm, you know, right? And they so quickly, like in weeks, saw the resonance of their business model and their value proposition with their customers. Then they said, okay, well, the first thing they had to do is they had to buy some trucks because you can only shove so many diapers into an SUV. And then they needed a truck to get everything had to be at the UPS loading dock by 629 every night, come hell or high water, to honor the next day delivery guarantee. And they missed one in a blizzard. And one of the customer service people got in her SUV, drove two and a half hours, couldn't get up the driveway to the customer's house. So she got out of her SUV, put the diapers on her shoulder, trudged up the driveway, knee deep in snow. Hi, I'm Susie from diapers.com. UPS wasn't delivering here today, so I got in the car because we promised next day delivery. And they got viral stories and they got referrals and they had an ocean of business I wish on every one of you. I've had this happen once in my life. It is as, as probably as close as you can get to you know, sex with your clothes on, right? Um, uh, where you are literally beating customers off with sticks, right? So then they said, okay, now we gotta make this into a business. So they started with some wholesale con. First they had to buy bigger trucks to clean out more Costco's and Walmart's and Toys R Us. Then they had to get a little warehouse to handle all the pack and ship. Then they have a, have a contract with UPS to have the truck come to them instead of them go to the truck, save 40 minutes at the end of every day of the, you know, loading the truck and moving, just at 629, the UPS van showed up at their plant or whatever you want to call it. Okay. And within a few more months, they had a warehouse, they had wholesale contracts, and they knew, you know, you still can't, where, where, how are they gonna make money, right? Top of the bottom right-hand box, revenue model, right? Don't worry, if we lose money on every order, we'll make it up on volume, right? That doesn't quite work that way. Then it was, how about baby oil? How about Q-tips? How about wipes? How about formula? How about, how about, how about, how about? And so they were able to edge the pricing up and start to make some margin along the way. Long story short, $1.2 million 
sale to Amazon.com. Zappos was the exact same story. And what they did was they went to shoe stores all over town. Hi, if you let us take a picture of every shoe in your store, when somebody buys it from us online, we'll come over here, we'll pay you 80% of whatever you're charging for that shoe, and we need it in that size. And so they had an instant citywide shoe warehouse because they weren't testing the product, they were testing the value proposition, the customer experience, at almost zero cost, right? Almost zero cost to get that far to see that you really had a business. So let me tell you the other end of that story. The other end of that story is a husband and wife in Stanford, Connecticut. Uh, a friend of mine, a good friend of mine, begged me to go spend a couple hours with these people. They had borrowed 450,000, older couple, like mid-late 50s, borrowed $450,000 against their house, which was fundamentally all the equity they had in the house, because they had a startup vision. They were into, uh, they were Italian, they're into making pizza at home. And they created something that simulated a real, you know, brick pizza oven in their oven at home by sliding bricks into the sidewalls of the regular oven and sort of gluing them in and so forth so it functioned like a brick oven even though it was a regular oven. And the reason they wanted to see me was first they wanted to show me the beautiful framed four color picture of the two forklift trucks they bought. Then they had to show me their beautiful warehouse and they had 9,950 of these brick oven kits, beautiful four color packaging, stacked to the ceiling on pallets, and they show, had to show me their 20 minute infomercial, and they had basically spent 430 of their $450,000 without ever trying to test any of this with customers. Why? All their friends said, wow, the pizza's really great. You can do this in your oven. That's really cool. If you made one of those, I'd buy it. So they, instead of finding a way to test it or perish the thought, making 250 and putting them in their garage without a forklift and spending some money going to cooking shows or stay, you know, tables in fairs and malls to get some customer feedback, they spent every dime of their $450,000 because they were sure, based on customer feedback, that this product was gonna be great. But it wasn't honest customer feedback. I'll tell you, you invite me to your house and you feed me a nice meal and some wine, I will tell you that whatever your idea is, it's spectacular, I promise. It's, the feedback is so biased. Right. First of all, they were their friends, so the friends aren't going to say, oh, that's the dumbest thing I ever heard. Why would I mess up my oven? Or what happens when I need to make a meatloaf? I've got to pull all that crap out of the oven first. Right? So think of the difference between those two. Right? One didn't spend a dime until it was sure that customers were really eager to buy their value proposition other one spent every dime before they had any objective measure of their value proposition at all. So if you think about many of the business, how many of you are doing, you know, web or mobile startups? Anybody not doing a web or, okay, we got one cup, okay, right? Most of your ideas in the web and mobile world can be live before breakfast tomorrow in some way, shape, or form first couple pages of the site, a blog talking about the problem you're solving. See, not only does anybody come and comment, but do people forward the information to their friends? Do they think, wow, I'll do a lot of my friends a favor if I tell them about these people that are thinking about how to solve this super colossal problem. That tells you a lot very early. WordPress is free, right? It's free, zero capital investment to put a blog out there on, you know, instant falling in love dating service, you know, love guaranteed, or take this pill, lose 20 pounds in the morning. See if people come to the site, 
See if they comment, gee, if you guys are serious and this really works and there are no side effects, sign me up. Here's my email address. And by the way, I'm going to email that to five of my chubby friends because I'm going to be doing them a favor telling them about your great new idea. Get a pulse on your customers today, tomorrow, right away. Don't wait till the second competition or this training or that. You should be doing this on the very first day of your you know, life in a startup, right? And you're asking a lot more than just, when you're out talking about the product, a lot more than just, well, do you like the product, right? It, it could be things like, you know, how serious is the need? How good is the product solution or, um, cut, you know, sort of market, product market fit? Who is the actual buyer? Sometimes the buyer is the user, sometimes it's not. Sometimes you need to get the user excited and go with the user up to the buyer. Like if you're selling uh, you know, kids video or online game packages or whatever, kid usually doesn't have a credit card and it's against a lot of market to kids with credit card you know, required anyway. So figure out some of these pieces, including probably the toughest one, how are people going to find me, right? If I have this great new whatever product, how will people discover that product? Will they hear about it from friends? Will they go to flea markets or street fairs? Will they read about it in press articles or on the web? Will Google AdWords effectively help them find me? It's so much more than just, is this a problem? And do you like my solution to the problem? And do they expect it to be delivered by an installer? Do they expect it to arrive by UPS? Do they expect to be able to download it off the web? Do they expect a free trial? What are all the dynamics of the customer's interaction with your product? And then process that, if you will, through the business model canvas to make sure, not necessarily right away, but yeah, if we get this business moving a little bit and we get a little better at customer acquisition, cost management, and we get a little smarter at targeting our audience and we do this and we do that, do we see a vision to ultimately being able to make money doing this? And so you're basically going out and taking each box from your business model and trying to figure out how you're going to test it and how you're going to determine sort of whether your answer is um, valid or not. And very, very often, you're going to wind up at a point called the pivot, which is simply stated, oh, crap, this isn't really working. A lot of people aren't buying my idea. What do I do now? And you see those little red uh, <coughs> arrows in each of the circles, pardon me, right? Those for, for the mathematically impaired, like myself, those are called recursive arrows, meaning you're going to keep going around and around this barn until you get it right, OK? More than anything, getting it right is about knowing when to say, OK, this isn't working. And the fact that we told our investors we're going to do this, then this, then this, then this, is irrelevant if we are convinced that it's not working. In a big company, a pivot or an, oh, crap, this isn't working, is usually followed by somebody big getting fired. Usually it starts with the VP of sales. Everybody then wastes a ton of time at the coffee pot saying what's going to happen, who's the new guy or lady going to be, what's going to happen to my job, what, you know, and whatever. Then the new VP comes in and says, well, I can't do anything we've been doing before because that got the last guy fired, so I got to throw everything out the window and start over, right? A pivot in a big company is usually a crisis, usually marked by termination or many terminations or ending or termination of the company. In a startup, you almost want to celebrate the opportunity for a pivot, provided you know that you have gotten enough feedback 
to validate the fact that you are not getting anywhere in a hurry. All right, to that gentleman's question, and I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, further. Our recommendation, we had to put a number in the book because you couldn't just put a blank. You can't begin to think about what you know about the problem you're solving if you haven't talked face-to-face -face with 50 customers, okay? That's, it's a number, it could be 46, it could be 62. And what you want to be hearing more than anything is the same consistent feedback. Once you start to see patterns of, yeah, I would only, I'd be glad to have that available at a convenience store or a gas station. That'd be a great place to buy it. Or, you know, I would only find out about something like that in, you know, a scientific magazine. Or, boy, if Huffington Post wrote about that, that's where I would go to find that kind of thing. Or Vogue or Glamour or whatever. When you're starting to hear that feedback consistently, you can sort of check box number one or two or six on the business model and say, okay, I think maybe we got this one right. But you're always going to find at least a couple that, that need a change. So let me give you just two or three quick examples of pivots. I mean, the, the problem is pivots today are sort of so trendy that the New Yorker has actually... Uh, immortalized the pivot just uh, two, three months ago with a cartoon of a very elegantly dressed man and woman sitting in a fancy restaurant at a table for two, each with a glass of wine. And she said, Henry, it's not that I'm leaving you. I'm just pivoting to another man. <laughs> and, and I think once, it, once the pivot made the New Yorker, we knew there were too many of them, uh, especially, and Henry did too. Um, Pivoting isn't a sport. You don't want to abandon an idea too quickly. You want to be sure that it's a bad idea before you throw it all upside down and throw out all your work to date. I have a group in uh, one of my startups in Bogota came to me and said, well, we've done three interviews and we're ready to pivot and change our business model and all of that. Three interviews, that's like rehearsal. <laughs> Go have 30 more, then come back and talk to me. And they're about halfway through that, and they may still, they may have been right. But why, it's sort of like, why would you give up everything you've done to that point based on a handful of interviews? Maybe it was a rainy day, and you're, you know, selling, you know, convertibles. Or it was a snowy day, and you're selling bikinis. There are so many variables beyond your control, you need to hear this consistent feedback. So two good pivot stories. First is Groupon. Uh, anybody here not a member of Groupon? Oh my God, okay. You call yourself children of the internet age. All right. Anyway, um, when Groupon began, it began as a company called The Point. And the point of The Point was to get groups of people in Chicago together to do social good. <laughs> to, you know, go fix up a homeless shelter, paint a church, clean up a park, you know, raise money for kids, whatever. And that they, their business model was they'd sell advertising against this sort of enlightened activist audience. And a few months or so into it, they are realizing they are just getting nowhere fast. They're not getting the groups of 50 people together to do the activities, and they're not getting enough page views to sell any advertising and they're coming to this bad ugly conclusion in the lobby of their elite slum office building where in the lobby was Joe's pizza joint and they're sitting there drinking beer having pizza you know like one o'clock on a Thursday saying oh crap what are we going to do this is really not working do we just shut down oh what are we you know what are we going to do should we try more Edwards should we try a blimp should we try banners on you know Michigan Avenue and while they're all talking, the brain trust is talking, one of the guys wanders over to the counter and says, hey, Joe, it's 1 o'clock on a Thursday. You've got, like, nobody in here but us. We have all these lists of people in Chicago. What if you did, like, a two-for-one day at Joe's next Thursday and say, as long as 50 people show up, buy one pizza, get one free? 
Joe says, I'll try anything to get you guys out of here and get some real customers in here that don't spend three hours eating two slices and a beer. Um, so they did a test email, right? Using WordPress, again, zero cost, right? And they did, hey, Thursday is Groupon Pizza Day at Joe. I don't think it was called Groupon at that moment. It was, you know, pizza partners, whatever. Come to Joe's, buy one, get one free, as long as 50 people show up between 12 and 3 on Thursday. Joe's was mobbed. Groupon was born. IPO, $12 billion. A pivot, right? A change in the fundamental business model. In this case, they didn't change the pricing. Groupon was still free, right? They changed other elements of the value proposition. What do I want to bring you together to do? Sad commentary on all of us. The people would rather get together to save money on pizza or bikini waxes or massages or whatever the hot Groupon of the day is instead of doing good for the world. But it is, you know, it is what it is. And they were a for-profit company trying to figure out how to make a profit and good for them. The other one that I love is, uh, I told you briefly about Steve's eighth company, Epiphany. Um, Epiphany was this massive multi-platform data mining operation, so, you know, software tool set that could go into every one of a company's databases and find Bob Dorf in every database. How many times did he call the help desk? How many times did he buy? Did he have any returns? Uh, did he find us through AdWords or blogs or how did he find us? Um, which products is he using? How often is he using the products? Has he ever referred a customer to us? Has he ever used a promotion? And it would aggregate all of that data and create an individualized marketing campaign to Bob Dorf saying, hey, Bob, we think you really ought to do this because based on what we know about you, this would be a great thing for you and here's a deal on it or whatever. And Epiphany's tools were so powerful, they could do that individualized one-to-one -one marketing campaign for your company whether you had 100,000 customers or 50 million customers. And the most obvious market target for Epiphany's software suite was the newly emerging online banks and brokerages that all of a sudden had all their customers moving online that were trying to figure out how to market to them. And obviously, people who have $100 in the bank think differently than people who have 100000 in the bank about what they're going to do with their money and so on and so forth. So Epiphany's number one customer target was Charles Schwab, right? Relatively new to online brokerage, one of the first, one of the you know, braver, smarter pioneers. And with, uh, I forget the CEO's name at the moment, but anyway, with the CEO's permission, they put... Mary Kelly, the VP of Database Marketing, on the Epiphany Customer Advisory Board because Schwab wanted to be the first to buy Epiphany to get the strategic advantage over its competitors of being able to individually market to all its account holders and prospects. So Steve and his technical co-founder, Ben, uh, are in Mary Kelly's office for the eighth time pitching the, the sale, million dollar sale at the first drop and basically got thrown out. Mary said, guys, I love you. I love the idea of your product, but I've told you this seven meetings in a row. I'm telling you for the last time, if you don't give us the ability to household the data, we're not buying your product. Data householding means that if you're marketing financial stuff to Bob Dorf, you probably want to involve Fran Dorf, my wife, as well, because most households make those kinds of decisions together. So if you tell Bob, buy stocks because you're crazy, and Fran, buy bonds because you're conservative, it's very hard for them to think, be impressed with the Charles Schwab recommendations, and it's probably very hard to get any more business out of them. So you merge those two data sets, and you treat them as a household. So they, you know, pack up their computers, they get their tail between their legs, they get into Steve's car to drive back 45 minutes to his living room, which at the time was world headquarters. 
45 minute drive, a half hour later, Ben, the engineering co-founder, hasn't said a word. He's been, you know, st his shoes were doing interesting things. He was staring closely and intently at his shoes. Ben, what are we going to do? Ben says, what, do what do we do about what? Ben, we told every financial services company on earth that we were signing Schwab this month, and they all said, crap, if you sign Schwab, we have to sign up too. So they're expecting us to announce our contract with Schwab this week or next week, and we just got thrown out on our butts. Ben says, yeah. Ben, what are we going to do? Oh, it's easy. Tell them to read page six of the product spec. Steve says, Ben, what are you smoking? The product spec is five pages. And Ben sits back and smiles and says, not anymore. And they added a page that said, householding, here's how it's going to work, and it's part of the core of the suite and so forth. And then they went back to the engineers working in the rented house next door to Steve's home, about 12, 14 of them, and said, hey, guys, we know you've just been working around the clock for three weeks for the big Schwab presentation. Well, it didn't go too well. So we need another month of heads down. We're going to rip this, 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 and this out of the product that you just finished building. And we're going to build all this new stuff on page six on the product spec. They got the Schwab order. They got every other brokerage on earth, E-Trade, J.P. Morgan Chase, you name it. And that was the first of a bunch of categories. The thing hit, as I said earlier, $8 billion in market cap less than three years later aided and abetted in no small measure by the internet bubble. Now, a couple of things. Number one, right, it was the two founders hearing that feedback directly, right? If the VP of sales had gone to that meeting, he or she would have come back and said, I think we got a problem with Schwab. I don't think they're really ready to buy yet. We got to do more work and we have to tell them how we're going to get to householding, right? because the salesperson doesn't want to take Schwab off the hot prospect list, doesn't want to get the founders crazy or angry. So they're going to sort of buff the edges of the story uh, a little bit. The founders heard it and said, I think she told us pretty unequivocally, if we ever expect to see an order, we have to have this. So I guess we have to have it because our whole business is sort of hanging on it. And they blew a big whistle and told the developers, stop, do the, you know, that sort of thing. That's why you need to hear this stuff yourselves. You are the only people who can say to your whole team, time out, we're going this way, or we're going that way. Because I'm the founder, and I have heard it, and I have heard it enough times where I'm convinced that we are not going in the right direction to be a successful business. Um, so just a couple more slides and then what a couple of questions and then uh, uh, assign them their homework for right homework. okay um, oh right that's at 11.45 which is like 10 minutes ago okay all right so um, just I um, so let me we'll stop right here when you are a startup the only absolute fact you have is your bank balance Right? And your best idea of when that number is going to approach zero or worse. And so you have to find a sane balance of making these kinds of pivots or changes fairly quickly, but making sure you do it with enough feedback to make sure it's not a, you know, a premature evacuation, right? that you're not abandoning ship too quickly. And the best resource to help you do that are the professors and faculty and mentors in this room who have the scars on their back, who've seen some of this before and can add some gray hair and wisdom to your thought process. And, you know, they only want you to succeed. So they're, they're going to say, well, I think maybe go talk to 10 more and make sure you're hearing the same thing. Or... Yeah, you're absolutely right. This is never going to work. I think your customers have told you why. But you need to make these with some agility, with some speed, because you're sort of chasing that ticking time bomb 
of the, you know, the bank balance um, heading toward zero. Um, so I think that's probably enough, enough slides. This is the full-blown, all the steps of customer discovery. We're going to come back and talk through, OK, now you have your canvas. What do you do next? And we'll talk about that more later this afternoon.